Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So we don't, we don't need a mic. <laughs> well, Dr. Warham is... Um, I, we have done one time one interview with him and it was very exciting. And I am very pleased that he attended and accepted this uh, interview again. Um, and thank you very much for sharing for sharing with us. Uh, I will. I don't need to introduce himself much, but uh, tell me about uh, a little bit about you. Well, I am a cardiothoracic surgeon, and I retired uh, over 20 years ago because there's a mandatory retirement age at Loma Linda. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was at that time, and uh, I happen to be one of those people that put in that rule. I retired at 72, and so when that came, time came, I retired uh, from being a surgeon. I went overseas for a couple of years to Saudi Arabia. Uh, we ran a cardiac surgery program for the people in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they now run themselves, but in those days we used to be intimately involved in that. And then when I came back, I uh, was invited by cardiac surgeons in the Los Angeles division to come down and assist them in cardiac surgery. And uh, I wanted to be doing something, so I started doing that. And um, the way I happened to get into the blue zone uh, was that uh, Buechner was here, and he was looking for the people who were 100 years old. Uh, but he, he heard that, uh, that uh, there was a, uh, that I was working, and I was in my 90s, 90 years, uh, older than 90 years old. So that was why he happened to include me in his interview, was the fact that uh, I was actually still working. And uh, I worked assisting in cardiac surgery until I was 95. So uh, that's uh, how I happened to get that uh, publicity. So in 90, with 95, you uh, literally retired? I, I made up my mind while I was working that I would pick out a day and I would retire when I wanted to retire, not when I had some disability or something. And I thought, if I don't have a disability by the time I'm 95, why, I'll quit at 95. So I quit at 95. <laughs> Good. Tell me, tell me a little bit about this uh, history about the fence. They said that you have to build up a fence, and then uh, and then you uh, oh. ended up doing by yourself. Uh, uh, anyhow, uh, it was announced in the women's auxiliary that um, Dan Buechner was coming into town uh -huh. to study the old people, <laughs> and uh, my wife was with the ladies there. And and she said, he ought to go up and see my husband. He's 91 years of age, and he's up there building a fence. Uh, and um, I was building this fence to keep my dog away from my neighbor, because my neighbor objected to the dog coming and barking at him. I have a large lodge, so I had to build about 250 feet of wooden fence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I uh, asked for bids on this, and. Uh, they wanted, I think, four thousand dollars to build the fence. <laughs> so I inquired at uh, Home Depot, and I found out I could get the material for about fifteen hundred dollars. So I built it myself. And so uh, they told Buechner that I was up there building the fence. But uh, after they found out I was still working in cardiac surgery, they forgot all about the fence. <laughs> And then they wanted a picture of me in the operating room because, you know, people like those sensational appearing things. Although, for me to be operating didn't amount to anything. I'd been doing that all my life. And uh, when I assisted, I just did minor parts of the operation and helped the surgeons. I think that it's uh, proper for a person to retire while he has his full strength. I don't think that I should have been being the primary operator after I would say 72. Okay. Um, so it, it looks like when you made the, the decision with 95, 
the guys in Los Angeles, they want to keep you there. Yes, they, they wanted very much to keep me assisting them and, and uh, to show their real, uh, the real truth of their interest. Uh, one group offered to pay my malpractice insurance on them. <laughs> With 95 years old. So, uh, and I could, at the present time, I could go and uh, do the same thing I did in 95. Um, I have the same ability now that I had then. I needed to spend a little more time at home. So when you, when you were building up the fence, uh, and then someone mentioned here about exercise. Do you remember uh, what you answer about exercise? Because they ask you if you have been to Drazen Center. <laughs> well, I uh, grew up on a farm. I was used to doing manual labor when I was young. And uh, I have never carried on any activity like walking or running or things like that. That's just exercise for exercise sake. I'm of the mindset that if I do something, I want to see some results. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a large lot uh, where my house is situated. It takes me quite a bit of work to look after the shrubs and lawns. So I've always mowed my own lawn. I've never had a gardener, even when I was uh, in active practice, because the advantage of looking after your own property is that it forces you to do that. The grass grows and the shrubs grow, and unless you hire it done, why, it will grow all out of shape. So, even at the present time, I mow my lawn and do the work around my yard because I'm forced to. It grows and I have to do it. A more disciplined person, of course, could get by without having things like that. Still have a dog? Please. We still have a dog? A dog? Yeah. Yeah, I have a little chihuahua now. Sure. <laughs> and I, uh, I had two larger dogs. I had a mutt and I had a, had a golden retriever, but they died. Uh -huh. They died of old age. And the chihuahua now is 18. I don't but I understand that's beyond yeah. their natural. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have many friends? I mean, uh, uh, at your age, it's kind of hard to have uh, friends that are still around. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I wonder about the amount I should be able to do to compare it to somebody else, but there's no uh, one I find around that I can compare myself to. They're all gone now. In my class in medicine, there were 77, and now there are six of us alive. Mm -hmm. when, when did you graduate? 1942. 1942. Okay. And um, well, tell me about uh, a little bit about the secrets of uh, what what you attribute your longevity to. Well, I think that one has to consider first his heredity. Uh, there are some people that just come from a good line of long-lived people. Uh, Your parents are where? How's that? Your parents. Well, well my parents died at, uh, my father died at 80, but my father was not an Adventist and used, had used tobacco. Oh. And uh, so he died when he was 80 uh, of a cancer of the colon. And my mother died when she was about 85. I have two grand aunts who live to be in the high 80s. Mm -hmm. And I would presume they may uh, get some benefit from their line of genes. So I think that I have in my family a moderate gene pool in Rothman. But uh, as you know, lifestyle outdoes the genes. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any question about I have, for the last half of my life, been quite careful about my habits of 
You know how much health care is in this country per year? 2.2 trillion, that's four years back. So I know it's much higher now. It's probably three trillion now. All right, and you just listen to what I say. If you can reduce the cost of health care in this country by one third, you could save a, a trillion dollars and we could balance the budget on health care alone. On health care alone. That's vote for him for president. <laughs> That's, that's so, the solution is easy. If they brought me to Washington, D.C., I can tell them <laughs> in five minutes how to solve the whole problem. Not raise taxes. Not raise taxes. Not do a single thing. Just nail one thing. Get them on an Adventist program. <coughs> now, <coughs> there have been some very fine books written, like the Blue Zone written by... <coughs> Buchner and so forth and so on. But let me point out to you that Buchner in this book describes the places where the people live the longest. Now if you just take a look at this book and you read this book, you'll find this, that all these people live under primitive conditions. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Okinawa, I'm talking about Sardinia, I'm talking about Costa Rica. These people are living with the sheep and the goats. Now I'm not depreciating them. I used to live with the sheep and the goats myself. But they're not in a highly developed modern society. These are not professional people, people that are, off, that, that are holding responsible positions, that are working offices, that have sedentary jobs. These are farmers out digging in the hills. You read the book, you'll find that out. Now the exception to this is, in the Blue Zones, they describe the Adventist church. And you know whom they're quoting? They're quoting Gary Fraser of the School of Public Health mm -hmm. and his colleagues who wrote a paper in 2001. And it says, the name of the paper says, uh, 10 years of life. This is the name of the paper. 10 years of life, you see, is it a choice? Well, it is a choice, 10 years of life. And, and this is the most significant medical paper I think ever written. Now, let me explain to you why. Because an Adventist male who is a vegetarian will outlive a, a California male in the regular population by nine and a half years. Now, now we're not talking about somebody that's running around the hills and digging with a spade. We're talking about 32,000 people that were studied. 34,000, pardon me. Mm -hmm. 34,000 people studied. That's a pretty good sample. Now, I happen to be in the medical field. I know what papers are about and what statistics are about and so forth. You study 34,000 people and you've got a solid sample. That's just not light discussion. That's real. And these are just the same people that you have all over the civilized world. When Dan Jupiter writes his book, he's writing about these people running around on the hills, and the only people that belong to a developed industrial society are the Seventh-day Adventists. And we outlive all these people. We're the longest living people in the world. They always count that the little phrase, the longest lived people study. You show me somebody who lives longer than the Seventh-day Adventists. They don't exist. We're the longest living people in the world, and we're in the highly developed California. California is no slouch. We may be in debt, but we, we produce. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Uh, maybe they, maybe somebody wants to ask me a question. Yeah, that's what we are going to jump to. Anybody want to ask me a question? <laughs> Tell us about your diet. What's your diet? diet? My diet? Yeah. Well, I'm a vegan. Now, it used to be that vegans were considered to be sort of in the fringe, you know? Those people that were sort of extreme, you know, they'd be here dairy products. But I want to point out to you that when Esselstyn and Ornish reversed coronary artery disease, they reversed it. Coronary artery disease kills one-third of the people in the United States, and they reversed it. You just stop and think about that. 
See how what did they do it on? They did it on a vegan, low-fat diet. Do you know why they did it on a vegan diet? Is it because any animal product will keep your cholesterol up? You can't get the cholesterol down. Now you can reduce it, you know, by leaving the fat off. But Campbell of Cornell, who wrote that excellent book, The China Study, says that animal proteins are as bad at raising blood cholesterol as at our the, I should, the animal proteins are as bad as animal fat. So you take and pour off the cream and drink the skim milk, the protein will get you. If you can lower the cholesterol and you can reverse coronary artery disease on a vegan diet, you can't do it even if you're drinking milk and, and uh, taking this <coughs> uh, proteins. It has to be vegan. Animal proteins are not, uh, not a friend. And that's what, I, that's what I do. Now, I'll have to admit that I grew up on a farm. I always considered milk a messy business. I milked the cows. If you ever milk the cow, it's not the most hygienic procedure. <laughs> and, and I never drink milk with a glass. My mother used it in cooking and, and uh, so forth. But I never did drink milk with a glass or eat eggs as such. Now, she used them in the cooking. So I have that background of being light on animal products. Now, I didn't do it for any health reasons, it's just that I didn't care for them. But when I found out I didn't need them, boy, they are out the door. I'll tell you, anytime I can drink a glass of soy milk, I'm not gonna drink the secretions of a cow. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you put these up. We always use these nice phrases like, I'm gonna have a T-bone steak. You're not gonna say, I'm going to pee, eat a piece of dead cow. You see? We, we, we dress it up. We don't say what it actually is. But milk is nothing but a secretion out of a cow. And, uh, so why, why tamper with it? Can and now we know. Yes? Can I ask another question? Um, how about your health? Because many people in the blue zones, they live longer, but they have all ailments. They eat, uh, they have lots of pills and things like that. <laughs> well, uh, I have an ache or pain of any kind, and I haven't had. I have no headaches, no back aches, nothing. Incidentally, I broke, broke my back one time in an automobile accident too, totaled the car, and I have a crushed vertebra. But I don't have even that, any back aches with a crushed vertebra. I don't have any arthritis. And I haven't had a cold, I can't remember when I had a cold or the flu. Now I have an advantage now that I don't go any place, I'm at home, so. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, a large lot there to yeah. walk around. No pills? How's that? No pills? I take a multiple vitamin. <laughs> <laughs> I do take uh, a little medicine for my blood pressure. But high blood pressure runs in my family, and my blood pressure started to go up about three or four years ago. So I take a little medicine to keep my blood pressure down. You didn't have any major disease in your life that you have been the hostile and serious thing. Well, I'll tell you something that most people don't know. And that is, I had pulmonary tuberculosis. Hmm. I never talk about it, never write about it, say anything about it. But I spent nine months in the hospital with pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, you were young when that. Very young, when you were very young. I was when I got out of the Navy. Yeah. They discovered when I got out of the Navy. Mm. Yeah? Um, Ornish also talks about other factors that to reverse the coronary. And one is stress.
he broke down what extended your life. And you know what extended your life the most of the ha habits you had? Eating nuts. Eating nuts will extend your life 3.75 years. 3.74 years. And that comes ahead of high level segment exercise, which will extend your life 3.73 years. <laughs> now, veganism, not veganism, vegetarianism, that's, that's actually like a rule of vegetarianism, mm -hmm. will extend your life 1.53 years. Mm -hmm. And being lean will extend your life 1.41. And never having smoked, at least in your life, 1.75 years. Now I'm getting back to this business of stress. Uh, as being a cardiac surgeon, I think I should understand what stress is to a certain degree. If you lose the child of a widow lady, the only child, you have a certain amount of stress. You know what I mean? Yeah. You operate on losing. You go out in the waiting room and talk to mother and say, I just lost your only child on the table. So I think I have a little understanding of stress. But let me say this, that I did not live a stressful life. Even though I was quite active in cardiac surgery and I was with the school here all my professional life and did cardiac and pulmonary surgery and so forth. Because <coughs> According to the biblical instructions given to us by Christ himself, we're not to worry. And Paul makes it very clear in his writing to the Philippians and to the Thessalonians, in everything give thanks, even the misfortunes. And be not anxious, you see, about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, Make your request known to God. This is how the Philippians is properly known. So for a Christian, he has a great advantage. He has tremendous security. I don't wish to tread on anybody's toes or say anything that is critical, but a Christian shouldn't be spending much time in stress and in worry. It is not biblical. And <clears throat> it's true that the Adventists live longer because they're vegetarian. How much longer? 1.53 years. They must have something else going for them. I think they have going for them is this great body of spiritual truth. We don't appreciate this like we should. If you're going to take the Bible and take it literally, you have tremendous security. Professionally, you know, uh, in every way, you see. So, <coughs> if you're having stress in your life, it's time for you to start to read the Bible and to take it seriously. Take it seriously. What does Christ say? He says, why are you worrying about it? You can't add any stature. You can't do anything about it. Sufficient end of the day is the evil thereof. Don't worry about tomorrow, so forth and so on. So, anyhow, that's uh, my approach to the matter. Anybody else? I, I want to say one thing. <clears throat> you can practice your lifestyle, not only in eating and so forth, but the way you think. When I go to bed at night, and everybody has problems, you think maybe he doesn't have any problems, He's a wealthy retired doctor. He doesn't know what it is. But when I go back, when I go to bed at night, I do not hash over anything. And if I say anything to my brain, it is this. I am here to sleep. And that's my purpose here. I'm not here to settle any problems of any kind. And you can train your mind to do that. Think of some... Bible promises. The Bible's full of promises. Perfect. God's communicated with us. We're not just drifting around here, not knowing what it's about. We know where we came from. We know why we're here. We know where we're going. 
Now, not everybody has that advantage, but the Adventists do. And my opinion is, now this is not scientific, my opinion is Adventist longevity is due to their spiritual understanding. And you can add to it by being a vegan and getting out and exercising and running down the road and doing all those things. Those will all help. But you've got to have complete security and peace of mind and know where you fit in this great cosmos. In many places they mention about the purpose in life and how purpose in life make people to live longer and, and overcome the stress. And it's clear uh, after what he, Dr. Warren said that uh, we have purpose in life for me. We, we have the biggest uh, or, or the main uh, purpose in life that we can imagine in, in, in any, any other place. I, I usually, when I talk about stress, I talk about Viktor Frankl, that he, he start with the purpose in life thing. And he was a Jewish that was in the Nazi camp of concentration and uh, all of his friends were dying. So the purpose in life there was very low for him and he, uh, he survived with that idea. So I, I think about ourselves. We have everything to, to explain our existence here. Isn't that true? We have everything. We have a purpose. We know the past. We know why we are here in the present. And we know why what's happening in the future. Now, you just stop and consider this one verse out of, Thess out of Thessalonians. In everything give thanks. Everything. You might think, oh, that's a little, little, sort of a little mistake that has slipped in there. Paul didn't really understand or it didn't really mean everything, not everything. Mrs. White said, in commenting on this verse, that means even the things that appear to be against you, you're to give thanks to. So if you have some misfortune in your life, something comes along, it's bad, and everything gets that. Anybody else with a question? Is your chance to have a, to ask the other one? You will pardon me for lecturing you. I think that's a, something comes along with age. One should sort of restrain himself. <laughs> I don't get a chance to talk to very many people, and you people are suffering as a result. But as you notice, as they say, I may be in, I may be wrong, but I'm not in doubt. And, that's <laughs> <laughs> and, and you see, here you are, young enough to be my children and grandchildren, you see. So that gives me a little platform to lecture to. And, and then I've been around the block a few times, and I know, I know what's going on. And uh, I've seen what there is to be seen. But let me tell you this, that the most fortunate thing that we have, and get up each morning and thank God for it, is this great body of spiritual information we have. And I know that, you know, it used to be that People sort of had to push Miss White off to the side because she had that meeting business in there. But now that that's gone, I'll tell you, that body of information which he gave us, including the great vision on healthful living, 150 years ago, June, we knew, we knew everything that we know now, back then, 150 years ago. And, and the rest of the world was wandering around in the darkness. They, they thought they were so healthy to use tobacco. Now those are the great scientific medical centers. I can tell you even Johns Hopkins was not putting out very much that was worthwhile in the early part of the, 19, uh, the 20th century. The 1900s. You were better off if you didn't see a doctor up until about 1920. Better off. We don't come from a great heritage, I can tell you that AMD film. <laughs> well, they're still going around. This, uh, this business about uh, fish oil, that uh, we never went, we never entered this fish oil because this is not our, ours. 
it's not our principle to push on fish. And now we, they, they are coming with the studies that fish oil might not be that good for you. <laughs> it might not be good for the heart, it might increase your risk of cancer, and say, oops. <laughs> well, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. We go, go through a little, as it were, uh, developments in the scientific world. But we've had, we've had all the information we need to have on health and living. We've got it all. So do you think that family is important? We, we didn't talk about family. How old is your wife? My wife is younger than I am by 14 years. Incidentally, is not a vegetarian and doesn't have good health. She has arthritis and so forth, but she's gradually learning. Even you can learn from your own husband or wife. But, uh, the people in my own family don't necessarily subscribe to my. And, and this other thing, I want to say one thing. You might get the idea I preach to them. I say not one word. <laughs> There's one thing you don't do within your own family. <laughs> one of the one of the. Advice I'd like to give to every person who gets married and those who are married: Don't try to change your partner. <laughs> you don't change people after they've got out of the diaper stage. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. the hearing aids on me. And they're <laughs> home in a jar. So I get by most of the time without them. Would you tell me? <laughs> she is saying that in the church we are seeing many people start drinking coffee and eating meat now. And then uh, why is that uh, happening? Is, is it a compromise trying to be so much like the world yeah. to be accepted? Yeah. <laughs> or is it just because uh, we see a large amount of Adventists now are turning to eating meat and drinking coffee as a well, I, I buy the whole bundle of helpful living. You know, you read in the uh, newspapers and the articles that any coffee, there are antioxidants and there are various yeah. little, you know, things that are good for them. Well, uh, we've had the body of helpful living as a package and I buy the whole thing. I don't even bother reading those things. I can't tell you what the ill effects of coffee are. I know that it has caffeine in it. And, uh, keeps you awake at night. You have trouble, enough trouble sleeping with, without it. So I don't get into those fine points. I, I accept the whole health message as a bundle, Including veganism. But do you see the church going kind of weak in the health reform? Well, the church is sort of weak all over. You know, it is in the health principles. We're weak across the border. Our divorce rate in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the same as the divorce rate among uh, people who are not church members. Isn't that right? Uh, it's just part of the... As I say to my wife, whenever she starts to mention something that's negative, we live in an imperfect world. And unfortunately, uh, that's just the way it is. And the church is enfeebled. That's the word Mrs. White used. Enfeebled, she calls it. And uh, we have to do what we can in our own little <coughs> sphere to do what we can to vote about. And you know those statements that have been made, the brightest light among us will go out before the end of time. The brightest light. Where does that leave me? 
the little dim candle down here. Uh, we have to search for sincerity of purpose, you know, and really have a devotional life. You know, we know that we have to eat three times, if not at least twice a day. We have to eat in order to sustain the body. We've got to take and have a spiritual re reinforcement. We've got to have times of meditation and prayer. It's so easy to neglect those sort of things. But one will not have strength at all. How long have you been married? I'm married in 50, so that'd be 63 years. <laughs> and I'd like to say we've never had any problems in our family, never an argument, never a disagreement. That is straight out and out falsehood. <laughs> but I'll tell you, Christianity is a great thing for healing all wounds, all problems. It's the great answer. And it's so easy to know what truth is, you know. If you're going to be a Christian, you can either be a Seventh-day Adventist or a Roman Catholic. Nothing else makes any sense. You just stop and figure it out. All these fine Protestant churches, what are they protesting against? Worship upon the day established by the Roman Church. So all you got to choose is whether you want to be a Catholic or a Seventh-day Adventist or anything. I choose to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Live healthfully. Live long. <coughs> well, um, one more question. Then. One more question. Now that you are retired, how do you keep yourself occupied? No problem. First, I don't have much energy, and I spend a lot of time lying down, sleeping, resting, and the rest of the time I... Th that has not, never been a problem with me. I think that has to do with the person's disposition somewhat. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of these people that are up on their tiptoes, you know, have to be doing something all the time. I'm a person that has to say to myself, hey, this is the list of things you've got to do today. Get up and go. And I'm so glad when they're over and then I lie down. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't speak for other people in the framework of their particular personality. I know there are people that have to be doing things, but not I. I can just sit here and do nothing and think of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you keep your stress down. <laughs> I, I, I have a statement about stress, and I hesitate to use it. I th think it's a self-imposed luxury. Yeah. <laughs> pe people talk to me about stress. Now, I'm talking about in the Christian context. If you're not a Christian, if you're an atheist, I can see why you have stress. There's lots to have stress about. Everything goes wrong. And let me tell you this. The pessimists in this world are the smartest people. If you're, if you're an optimist, you're probably not very bright. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I fit. But the point is, if you're bright, you will be depressed. Things are bad. You're going to die. Well, I could get up in the morning and say, here I am. I'm 98 years old. In a couple of months, I'll be 99. You know, I'll be dead in a few months. Just concentrate on that for a while for a pleasant thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> or I can get up in the morning and say, here I am. Just think. I'll be gone in a few weeks, and then I'll be in paradise, according to our understanding of things. I mean, why are you all hanging around here? Nothing in this world to, to grab onto, or hang on. It's all just a matter of approach and the way you look at it. So, to summarize, I think the big 
advantage health wise that Adventists have is their body of spiritual truth. And you can tack on to it these other little things, you know, vigorous exercise, run a mile, four miles a day, you know, have that piece of meat or drunk any milk or anything for 50 years. You can put all that on it. That's pretty minor stuff. Hmm. Well, more questions. Uh, when the fellow <coughs> interviewed you uh, for the book, right? Did you, were you able to uh, advocate a spiritual component as essential? Uh, in the, when they interview you for the Dan Butner, yeah. were you able to emphasize the spiritual part or uh, they, or they passed this? Well, I, I must say I didn't get into any uh, discussion of that, no, I didn't. I recognized that he was looking for certain particular things. He asked me the questions. I answered them. I didn't lecture him. I like I'm lecturing you. I, I can be receptive to just answering questions. And uh, I did that with him. Uh, Buechner himself, of course, was very impressed with the Adventist church. And no question. He is not, he's fully convinced that the body of truth that they have. We did have that discussion. Because in the, if you, we have a paper there in the, in the uh, foyer that has the characteristics of the blue zone, and, and in Loma Linda, one is faith that is separate than the other three that they have in the book. Faith is a uh, is very important factor. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I think Buechner is actually convinced enough to be an Adventist if he here to make that sacrifice. I shouldn't speak for him. Mm. But, uh, any intelligent person that takes a good sharp look at the Adventist faith is in trouble. In real trouble. Because we got the truth and it's so simple and clear cut it can be understood by a person who's retarded. Mm. Okay, if we don't have more questions, we will um, finish this part here, and, uh, and we have a couple of minutes to study the Bible. We appreciate your presence here, and we will invite you over next year. <laughs>